the, the driving theme of this particular um, passage that I was asked to read is um, Isaiah chapter 60 from verses 1 and 2. But if you go to Isaiah 59 chapter 1, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that he cannot hear. And the reason I'm referencing that verse before I reference the main verse is that a lot of times we come to church and we come to revival seeking the hand of God over and over and over and over and over again. And sometimes we think maybe I'm not shouting loud enough that the Lord cannot hear me. So I have to raise the octave of my voice for the Lord to hear. And the Lord is telling us explicitly that his ear is not too deaf to hear and his hand is not too short to give. So if he has not given and he has not answered, then there is something else that he's looking for us to receive. So yelling your prayers louder is not necessarily what the Lord is expecting of you, or shouting it, or, or having 200 member prayer. So when you came to this revival today, other than the fact that you got a memo or an email or a text saying that there was a revival, why are you here? What are you looking to receive? from this today. And if you came here with an outstretched hand and a mindset and a heart set of give me, give me, give me Lord, then this is a time where you need to reevaluate that mindset now before we get started. Because this revival is not about what the Lord can give to me. This revival is about what the Lord can do to me. Today, this particular theme that we're going on is about what do I want the Lord to do to me? Not for me, as in giving, but doing to me. The focal verse says, Arise, shine, for thy light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people but the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. I had a dream or a vision a couple of months ago, and in the vision, all I saw was an array of vessels, containers, so to speak. They were glass containers, but the interesting thing about the containers was that they were all different shapes, and they were all very unique shapes. None of them was just like a traditional straight bottle or, you know, oval-shaped bottle. There's some were zigzag. They were just these very interesting shapes of vessels, but they were all made of glass, and they were all made of this thick glass, this very thick decorative glass. I don't know if you've seen these kind of like vases in the store. The glass was very thick, but they were all transparent, and they were all just very, very different. And what the Lord revealed to me by virtue of that vision was that these vessels represent you, the children of God. You're all different. You're all shaped differently. But the key thing was that they were transparent, meaning what you saw of the vessel other than the shape was what was contained in the vessel. So it is whatever is poured into that vessel that you will see because the glass was not colored. They were all transparent glass. So whatever occupies the space of that vessel is what is going to be seen from the outside. So this particular topic where it's saying has the is celestial church arising into its light. I think the question that we want to ask ourselves today in light of this thing about the vessels is that the vessel that is you, what fills it? What do people see when they look at you? What is showing through that transparent vessel? What is the thing that people can see when they look at your vessel? And it's a very important question that we really need to ask ourselves. And this has nothing to do with gifts and abilities and talents. This has to do with what fills your container. The Bible says, know ye not that ye are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of the Lord dwells within you. So the Lord is telling us that we are vessels in essence, and the substance of us is what we contain, what is inside of us. So what is in you? What fills you up? as a vessel. There is another portion of scripture that also says there are some vessels that are unto righteousness and there are vessels unto unrighteousness.
righteousness. So which vessel are we? Are we a vessel unto righteousness or are we a vessel unto unrighteousness? So what fills your vessel? What do people see when they look at you, when they hear you, when they observe you? Not when we stand in front of a congregation or when we're preaching or something, just in your day-to-day -day activities and the way that you conduct yourself from the moment you wake up to the moment that you sleep. What do people see in the vessel that is you? The goal of celestial is what I believe this verse represents. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall rise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. I see this as what the Lord has purposed for Celestial Church of Christ. But is this where Celestial Church of Christ stands today? Is this where we are today? Are we, are, are, we, are, we, are we in a state where we are risen? The light that is shining through us, is it the light that is being spoken of in this passage? Because keep in mind, we are reflecting something at every given time. There is no time that we are not a billboard. There is no time that we are not an ambassador. But who are we an ambassador for? Who are we representing? And it is not just when we don the sultana. At any given time, at every given time, who are we representing? And that is the question as Christians. Let's not even get to Celestians first. As Christians, it has become the same thing about the vessels, how they represent individuals. I believe it also represents churches and denominations because every church has its mission in this world. So the vessel that is Celestial Church of Christ is also, as we have all been told, and as we all know and understand, a very unique vessel. But let us keep in mind, Celestial Church of Christ is not a building. Celestial Church of Christ is not an abstract thing. We are Celestial Church of Christ. Celestians are Celestial Church of Christ. So the vessel that is Celestians represents the vessel that is Celestial Church of Christ. So the question we have to ask ourselves is that when the Lord ordained this church and when he set this church in motion, we who have come in the way, are we representing the image of the church that the Lord ordained? And this is not something we can point to this pastor or point to this preacher or point to this shepherd and say, ah, this parish, see what they're doing here. This parish, what are you doing? What are you as a Celestian representing? The vessel that is you, the Celestian, that is also the vessel that is you, that is the child of the Most High God. What do people see in you? Because people can say whatever they want to say about Celestial Church that they do not know about. But you, the Celestian, that they do know, what do you show? What do they see in you? Is it important to you what is in your vessel? Do we think about it? Do we think about the source? This chapter, this verse that we read also talks about the glory. Glory is one thing that we all do well with glory. However, the Lord is talking about his glory. But man has perfected his own glory. We are excellent at giving ourselves glory, as ascribing glory unto ourselves, and taking, and we all do it. We all do it in every single aspect of our lives. And the, uh, the HOD talked about, in, in the revival yesterday, he talked about whitewashed tombs, which was, as many times as I have heard a sermon preached on this, there was something about the way it was presented yesterday that just shook me to my very core. And he used a particular example about someone who was a respected elder, or so on and so forth, and the person was trying to condemn him. And I know probably why we were listening to his, half of the people were wondering, I wonder who he's talking about. I wonder who that person is. Hmm. I wish he would tell us the person's name so we would know who is this person that is condemning. That was probably most people's interest. When in actuality, what you should be asking yourself, how many times have I been that person that he's talking about? How many 
many times have I been that condemner that he's talking about? Now just because we are not talking about the HOD does not mean we do not act in that capacity every single day in lots of different ways. And just verbally condemning somebody is just one of the things that we do. If someone can open up John chapter 3, please, uh, from verse 16. John 3, 16 to 21. For God so loved the world. Yes. Go ahead. That he gave his son. Yes. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Yes. But that the world through him might be saved. Yes. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. And this is, this is the part that I want us to pay attention to. And this is the condemnation. That light is come into the world. Yes. And men love darkness rather yes. than light. Because their deeds were evil. Yes. But everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Yes. Neither cometh to the light. Yes. Lest his deeds should be reproved. Yes. But he that doeth truth comes to the light. That his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. Thank you. It's very easy to point out flaws in our brethren. It's so easy because again, we're all imperfect. So if we're all to have a notebook today and sit even just during the course of this day, we can probably have one page filled by imperfections that people will, um, will perform. And yet we put ourselves on a platform because again, it's very easy to identify a flaw that's also very different from our flaws. It's very easy to criticize. It's very easy to pass judgment and things like that. But what the word of God is telling us is that this is the condemnation. This is condemnation when the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. What does that tell us in essence? What's the, the, the HOD also said something very interesting yesterday about when it comes to resources, going into your resources. And think about it. Things happen to us all day, every day. And there is a way we respond to the things that happen to us. And the thing is that we are all individual vessels and we respond from the wells within ourselves. When anything happens, your response has nothing to do with the person who is offending you, who is talking to you, who is saying anything to you. Your, your response has to do with you because you go into your resources to take what you are going to use to respond. So the question you have to ask yourself, what are your resources? What is that resource that you are so quick to take from in order to respond to your brethren? It doesn't matter what they are doing to you, but what is that resource that we are so quick to go to? What is that well of water that is within us? If you live in New Jersey, there's this thing going on where they've been doing a lot of water testing in the schools and they found out there's a lot of lead contamination in the water. And this has been going on for years, but I guess they just never tested the water. And they're just coming around to test the water now and they're finding out that a lot of the public school systems have high levels of lead in their drinking water. Now this was only discovered because the water was tested. The well that is within you if your water is tested, what is going to be revealed in your water? What impurities are going to be found in the water, that well within you that you dig into every single time to water your soul, to water your spirit, to water yourself? Because it is from these wells that we respond. It is these wells that nourish our bodies. It is these wells that make us who we are. So what kind of water exists in your well? Because if it is the water that Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman about, he said this water you will continue to thirst. If you continue to drink from this well, we will continue to exhibit the imperfections that are completely contrary to the spirit of Christ. So Christ said, instead of drinking from that well, let him be the living water within us. Let him be the spring of living water in which no impurity can be found. But when we insist on drinking from our own cisterns, when we insist on drinking from our own wells, this is the darkness that the scripture talks about. Where men love darkness 
rather than light. Because in order for you to stop drinking from your well, that means the entire well within you has to be shut down. The water has to be drained out and it has to be replaced. But we don't want our wells shut down. Because we are comfortable drinking from our wells. We are comfortable drinking from our own resources. We don't want the change because we view the change as being hard. We are comfortable in the way we do things. We are comfortable in the way we are. And we have, we want God to come and miraculously change us. We want to wake up the next day and not do the things that we do without realizing that when it comes to accepting the light, it is we who have to turn from the darkness and accept the light. Christ will never force his light on anyone. You have to be willing to first of all admit that you are in darkness. You have to be willing first of all to admit that your wells are polluted and ask Christ to come and do a total and complete configuration, reconfiguration. Jesus Christ is not interested in what we do. Jesus Christ is interested in who we are. He is interested in who we become. He's interested in who we desire to become. It's one thing to walk along our own path and every now and then, when things get hard, we reach out for Christ. When things get difficult, we reach out for Christ. We touch Christ, we do this. But Christ is not looking to be a pit stop. He's not looking to be a restway. He's looking to be our main source. He's looking, there is no way if Christ lives within us that we can do things that are contrary to Christ because the spirit of Christ can never be contrary to himself. So if we are doing things that are contrary to Christ, it is because we are not dwelling in the spirit of Christ and the spirit of Christ does not dwell with us. And it is a choice. It is a choice. It is a choice that we make every single day. Every action indicates our choice. Every thought process indicates our choice. Every reaction indicates our choice. And then we kneel down and we pray and we stop all the elders and we do everything when we have no desire whatsoever to make a change. When Noah, after the flood with Noah, we're all familiar with the story, he sent out the dove. He sent the dove out. And every time the dove returned, why did the dove come back? Because it had no place to land. So it would come back. And then after seven days, he sent the dove out again. And the dove would return because there was no place to land. Until the final time when he sent the dove out and what happened? The dove never came back. Because it had found a place to perch. Now let's look at the flip side of that. Think about Christ's temptation in the wilderness. And the three times that the devil tried him, and the three things that the devil tried him with. Was Satan successful? No. He wasn't successful. This is the same Christ who we asked to come and live in our hearts, right? Is he not the same Christ? Is he a different version of Jesus? The same Jesus Christ who showed us by his example that it is possible to resist temptation. And we don't do it in our own strength because when he comes in us, whose strength does it? His strength. So if Christ has done this and Christ asks us to accept his spirit, why is it that when the birds of the enemy go out and come to us, why do they so easily find a place to perch on us? Why do they find a place to perch? Because if the, dove, if the, if the agent of the enemy has no place to land on us, what happens? It goes away. But if it finds a place to perch within us, what does that mean? We have allowed it to. We have given it a branch. We have given it an arm. We have given it a leg. There is only one way that thing cannot perch on us. If we are full of the spirit of Christ and we give it no place to land. So as long as we continue to give the enemy access into us, do we think it is just simply the prayers that we pray that will change it? Do we think we are in any way unaccountable for the things that we do? We have to recognize this when we are talking about the light of Christ. This is the light of Christ. The same Christ that survived the temptation of the wilderness. It is his spirit that lives in us. And if his spirit is in us, darkness cannot be in us. So when the Bible tells us, when the scripture tells us, arise, arise and shine.
shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. When the darkness covers the earth, who is supposed to have the light? The children of God. Because darkness will cover the earth. But what it says is that, for behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee. And his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light. And kings to the brightness of thy rising. Without the light in you, it can never happen. And unless we are willing to embrace the light, then the light can never come upon us. This this revival is a time for, as the theme is for today, the self-examination. And this self-examination, it has to be different. One of the prayers you pray today has to be, Lord, let me not leave here the same. And by not leaving here the same, not because that thing that you have been seeking for 20 years has been answered today. That is not what we should be seeking today. Be seeking to be shaken in a way that you have not been shaken before. Be seeking to have things about yourself revealed to you that have not been revealed before. If there has been any wall that we have put up ourselves, any walls of resistance, any walls of malice, whatever it is, and keep in mind, when we have all this resistance that we say towards our fellow man, it is not towards our fellow man, it is towards Christ. Because if Christ is sending something to you, either through someone or through his spirit, and we reject it, we are rejecting him. So when he's asking that the light arise and shine in us, we have to want it. And we have to want it as a replacement for that which exists within us. If you want to keep some of your things, Christ is not going to come. Christ does not do bits and pieces. He does whole. You either want him or you don't. So let today, when he's asking for celestial church, are we ready? Are we ready to arise into his light? The building of this, the four walls of this house cannot arise into the light of Christ. It is we. He is talking about the vessels that are we. And this is the question we have to ask ourselves. And if indeed we want his light, he will no way refuse us his light. May the Lord continue to bless us all. Amen.